if you shop the Christian bookstores or play on the Christian websites, you've probably noticed that from year to year, different topics become hot for a while. And then as those topics rise up, there seems to pop up books, CDs, DVDs, T-shirts, and all kinds of other related merchandise that flow along the same lines as that topic. And they come at us from all kinds of different sources. Prosperity, that you can have anything that you can name and claim movement, is always one of those kind of topics that's great for selling merchandise. End times or last day scenarios are great for moving the merchandise also. And then from there you can branch out into selling dried food stores and emergency water rationing. Just think of Y2K. Demonology, the New Age movement, Spiritism, all have had their day in the spotlight, and you can be sure they will have another day in the spotlight. Grace was a topic of conversation for a time, and angels, all oh, angels are always a hot topic. In fact, they're a hot, hot, hot topic. People often like stories about angels more than they like the truth about God. I guess there doesn't necessarily have to be anything wrong with these trends. Unless, of course, the teaching doesn't line up with Scripture. Then whether it's a trend or a, an organization that has solidified its presence, if it doesn't line up with Scripture, there is a problem. But I do understand that there are just times that issues arise in the church and in society, and people do wonder, what does the Word of God have to say about these issues? And so oftentimes, God will raise up individuals to speak to those issues. Why? Because God has something to say about everything that we face in life. But you know what I always say when people are looking for you know, answers to things that are going on around them and what is it that the Word of God has to say about it? The best option to knowing what the Word of God has to say about a situation or a topic is the Word of God. Many people want to know what God has to say about an issue or a topic, but they never consult His Word. They never say, hey God, you know, I don't know, I don't understand what's happening right here. I need some revelation. Did you know that God wants to give you revelation? God wants to open up your understanding, not beyond Scripture, but through Scripture. He wants to open up your understanding so you could see the time that we live in and know how to live according to God's standards in our lives. Now, some people think that I, I say, if you ever read another book besides the Bible, that you're going to hell. No, that's not what I mean. When you're studying a topic, if you are familiar with an author and you know that they have a solid background, that may be a good place to begin and help you with your studies. There are authors that are good. There are books that are good. There are some internet sites uh, in the Christian community that are good. I use some of them. However, we always have to have as our first and primary source the Word of God. And then however much we like an author or, an, or a source, they must line up with the Word of God. If we can't put the two next to each other and understand they're in harmony, we need to put one of them on the shelf. And it ain't the Bible. That's the other guy. So I'm not saying that you can't ever read a book or that if you ever gleaned any insight from a post online or from a daily devotional, that that's not relevant or not good for you. But what I'm saying is that God has given us His Word so that we could know Him and be like Him. So that we can know through His Holy Spirit how we are to live in this world. Because face it, there's an awful lot of confusing circumstances that come our way in life. And sometimes, when the Christian hawks just pile on the books and the videos and the supplements and the colon cleansing, that it just gets very confusing. And you laugh, but there are some well-known names on the Christian networks that are selling that stuff. But for all the topics, as crazy and as nutty 
And as far out in left field as it may seem, there is one topic that doesn't usually seem to trend, and that is holiness. I know there's an awful lot of material out there on the topic, but when I say holiness, I'm referring to true God-honoring holiness, true separation from this world and its systems, and keeping yourself only onto the Lord. I'm not talking about outward measurements as much as inner yielding and conforming to the standards of God. Typically, miracle about, uh, mir- excuse me, not miracles, though true holiness is a miracle. Typically, materials about true holiness do not make it to the bestseller list. Oh, that guy's awful judgmental. Oh, that guy, he's so legalistic. The subject is often just too uncomfortable for many people. It's much easier to read a biography about a happy-go-lucky sports hero turned Christian or a nice Christian romance novel. Let me ask you a question. Is there really any such thing as a Christian romance novel? I don't think so. I think that's a worldly concept that's entering the church that entertains the imagination of individuals and then perverts those imaginations. It causes a true lack of holiness and it builds an association with the world and the lusts and the desires of the world which conforms us to a standard that is less than God's standard. And sometimes we laugh when we talk about the Christian romance novels. But that kind of acceptance in the Christian community, even that kind of promotion within the Christian community, had opened the doors to a few years ago among born-again, spirit-filled, evangelical, whatever you want to call them kind of Christians that would once have been identified within our circles. Among those kind of people, the door was opened to Fifty Shades of Grey. And there were especially women that were reading it and couldn't wait for the sequel to come out. And when the movie came out, they ran to watch the pornography and they fell just head over heels in love in their imagination with this individual. I guess his name was Mr. Gray. I've never read the book. I don't really know the story, except that it glorified abhorrent sexual practices. Domination and submission and the like. And women were deceived. Christian women were deceived that that is a true representation of God's love and design and intention for man and woman. Especially, they even come to a point where they believe it's God's expression apart from marriage. There are many topics out there that people throw themselves into without measuring them against the Word of God. Holiness is a topic that most people want to stay away from because they believe it to be too restrictive. But I say that true holiness is really freeing. So often the church seems to be more concerned with quicker, easy steps to get what satisfies their perceived needs than they are to understand true biblical principles that would teach us how to live right and holy lives. Unfortunately, most Christians are more comfortable saying, oh, well, you know, I'm just a sinner. God understands my weakness. Yes, he does, and don't be surprised when you split hell wide open with that kind of attitude. But Christians have been taught to accept and say with their mouths, I'm just a sinner. And I find this really funny among the name and claim it types, just the blab and grab it, just you have whatever you say. Well, I'm just a sinner. What do you keep confessing that for? My goodness, if this was ever a place where confession was good and real and should be practiced, you should be able to say if you are born again by the Holy Spirit of the living God, if you have repented from your sin and turned to Jesus, you should be able to look yourself in the mirror and say, I am a holy saint of the living God. If you are born again, accepted as God's son and daughter, and you've received the gift of salvation through the sacrifice of Jesus, it's exactly what you are. You are a holy saint of God. I want you to just take a moment 
And I want you to say that out loud. Say, I am a holy saint of God. Just say it right now. Oh, say it a little stronger. All right, that was much better. And you know what? You are just that. You are a holy saint of God. Some people say, well, I'm not perfect. I can't be a saint. I haven't been canonized. I can't be a saint. Got nothing to do with what a saint is in the Bible. A saint is someone that belongs to God. Not someone that has been recognized by men because they think your blood didn't dry up. Not because they saved the piece of your flesh and it doesn't look like it's decayed. A saint is those who have accepted the work of salvation through the shed blood of Jesus Christ, recognized that we are no longer our own. We belong to Him, purchased at a price. We've been grafted into the family of God, and we are His. And His holiness and His righteousness is credited to our account. See, many people have a hard time believing that about themselves. They know that they've heard the words, but they often have a hard time believing that they are a holy saint of God, that they can have the holiness of God in their life. See, for Christians, the problem is not usually that we don't want to be holy as much as it is we don't really know how to fight the bow of our flesh. We don't know how to fight in the Holy Spirit to overcome the worldly lust and desires, to rely upon the strength of God through the sacrifice of Jesus Christ so that that which He says about us becomes the reality that we walk in day in and day out. You see, we are often in a battle, but we're not really sure how or why we're in that battle. We know that we want to be holy. We know that we're supposed to be holy, but many of us don't really know what that means. We have been told it's our shirts down to here, our collars up to here, the hems down to there, and all earth tones. Make yourself look as ugly as possible and you're holy. (laughs) Now there's something to be said for modesty and not depending on outward adornment alone to win the affections of the people around you. But let me tell you something. You can have on the most modest of clothes and still be perverted in your heart. See, God is concerned about dealing with the heart of man. Because when God deals with our hearts, when God deals with the heart of man, it will roll itself out to affect the whole of man. Oftentimes we look at holiness and we try and conform the outside without the inside being transformed and renewed. God wants to do His work from the inside out. He wants to renew us from the inside out. See, we get born again, we get saved, we're in love with Jesus. We start hanging around with all these other people that have been hanging around with Jesus for a long time. And they look so holy and they look so righteous and they look so good. We're alive on fire! And we think, well, gee, I've got to learn to be more like them. And instead of growing, being transformed from the inside out, we begin to focus on the outside. Sometimes because of disapproving church people saying, well, you know, you really shouldn't dress like, you know, you really shouldn't talk, you know, you shouldn't act like, you know, you shouldn't, you know, you shouldn't, you know, you shouldn't. Never a word of encouragement, brother, I've seen you struggling and you are overcoming, I'm praying for you. Always want to stamp them down. I remember we used to have that problem with youth groups sometimes. You get kids in off the street and sometimes the girls weren't dressed very modestly and sometimes the boys kind of looked like they were slobs. And you have church people say, well, you know, they really shouldn't be dressed like that in church. And I say, and really, you shouldn't be talking with that kind of attitude in church either. (laughs) Be glad they're in the church. And they used to, are you going to talk to them about sex? They can't have sex. You know that. Listen, they come out of depravity. We're talking to them about Jesus. And we always believe that if we disciple them in Jesus, he would take care of those issues. See, because what we often try and do is we try and get kids to conform to the paths we want them to walk in rather than getting them to have a relationship with Jesus. See, when they have a relationship with Jesus, it is much easier than when the Holy Spirit brings up the topic to offer them instruction and have them receive it. Just the same with adults. Sometimes working with kids is easier than working with adults. But oftentimes we want to just conform the outside. God wants to change the inside. 
And when the inside begins to change, you know what, in time, the outside will change also. We had girls come in, yes, they came in, their skirts were probably too short. Yes, they didn't know how to behave in church. We had young guys came in, they didn't know how to use, you know, decent language to express themselves. But as Jesus began to grab a hold of their hearts, those things began to fall away because the Holy Spirit knows his business. And see, we often get wrapped up in trying to conform the outside. Not that we shouldn't, especially if we've been walking with the Lord, work to have the members of our body under control, but that should always flow of our relationship with God, not just our own willpower, because our own willpower will fail along the way and we'll have a false understanding of what holiness is and it will always be something that's unattainable. When the truth of the matter is, if we are born again, we've already received holiness in Christ. And in First Peter, we are challenged to live lives that are holy. And Peter shows us that the process of holy living begins on the inside. It begins on the way that we think. Once we win that battle, we will begin to see change in the way that we live and in the things that we do and the ways that we talk. There are four elements of holiness that we're going to talk about today and next week. They are recognition, preparation, separation, and consecration. We'll just be looking at recognition this evening. We will get to preparation, separation, and consecration next week. If you didn't catch all four of them, all you need tonight is recognition. 1 Peter chapter 1, verse 13 through 16. Therefore... Gird up the loins of your mind and be sober and rest your hope fully upon the grace that is to be brought to you at the revelation of Jesus Christ. As obedient children, not conforming yourselves to the former lusts as in your ignorance, but as he who calls you is holy, you also be holy in all your conduct because it is written, Be holy, for I am holy. Peter is quoting from Leviticus chapter 11 and chapter 19. In those passages, God is instructing on how to live a holy life, which is a life that is also wholly consecrated to Him. Leviticus chapter 11 verse 44 says, For I am the Lord your God. You shall consecrate yourselves, and you shall be holy, for I am holy. And then Leviticus 19.2 says, Speak to all the congregation of the children of Israel and say to them, You shall be holy, for I, the Lord your God, am holy. When you begin to see God in His holiness, it doesn't take long to conclude that there is no other like Him in all the worlds of the universe. 1 Samuel chapter 2, verse 2 says, there is no one holy like the Lord. There is no one beside you. There is no rock like our God. Isaiah 6.3 says, Holy, holy, holy is the Lord God Almighty. The whole earth is filled with His glory. Our God is holy, and His desire is for me and for you and for all that are called by His name to be holy, even as He is holy. So what does it mean to say that God is holy? God's holiness indicates His absolute perfection. He is unlike any other that ever has been or ever will be or ever is. His very being is completely absent of even a trace of sin. He has never sinned in the past. He will never sin in the future. And He does not sin in the present. The God whom we worship is perfect in every way. There is no evil, no wickedness, no envy, no rage, no lack in any other way. He is wholly perfect. There is no shadow of darkness, no turning of evil in His person. He is good and right and just in all things at all times. Well, that sounds like a real tough standard to measure up to, doesn't it? Are you ready for some good news along those lines? God has promised 
that he will view all of us who come through the door of salvation, not through our unholiness, but through the holiness of Christ Jesus. He will look upon us through Christ. He will see us in Jesus and we will be without fault in His eyes. We will be holy and sanctified unto Him. See, when you accept Jesus as your Savior, you also accept His holiness as your own. It's like your holiness account is credited with all the holiness of God in Christ Jesus. It's not that you have to come up with some way to make the payment. Have you ever had to do that? A bill was due and you had to rob Peter to pay Paul? You had to shift from this account to that account? You had to pay this credit card so you could pay that bill so you could take money from over there and get that back over there? You had to juggle the books a little bit. When it comes to holiness... If we are born again by the Spirit of God and we've come through the door of grace, we are holy and righteous in Christ Jesus. God sees us absent of our very obvious faults. Just think about that. When God the Father looks at us through the door of Calvary, He sees us through the blood of Jesus. Cleansed, separated, and consecrated unto Him. He sees us pure and holy because the blood of Jesus hasn't just covered over our sins, but has washed away the sins of our lives and the debt that came along with them. There's no more juggling of the books. The accounts have been reconciled. Peter and Paul both get paid in this scenario. And you don't got to take anything out on credit. The debt, the sin, the unholiness, it's completely erased by the blood of Jesus. In this acceptance of holiness, we can say with confidence that we are holy, that God has purified us, and we can stand before Almighty God without sin, and therefore we can enter into His courts with praise and thanksgiving rather than fearing guilt. That is really good news, isn't it? As good as that news, we can't just rest there. We can't just say, well, that's wonderful, and then abide in the same place. God expects us to do something with what He has given us. There is a sense that God expects us to live our lives in a way to reflect the great gift of holiness that He has given us. See, we don't earn holiness. Some people think, well, if I go to church the right amount of times during the week, and I go to prayer the right number of times, and I fast the right number of times, and I say, praise the Lord, hallelujah, glory to God, thank you, Jesus, enough times throughout the day, if I hand out enough little invitation cards, if I do just this, just right, then God will have to accept me. He'll have to see that I've worked so hard to make myself so good that He can accept me as holy. The righteousness of our own works will never get us to a point of holiness before God. Paul, who said, in respect to legalistic perfection, he was faultless. But the Lord just stood in condemnation of him until he knew Jesus. Until he knew Jesus and received God's gift of holiness, impartation of holiness in his life. Paul didn't really live a holy life. He lived a very religious life. He lived a legalistic life. He lived a life that many people would consider good and perhaps even godly. But he was far and separated. It was in yielding to the Father when confronted of the Holy Spirit and Jesus spoke to him that Paul received true holiness in his life. When he said, who are you, Lord? And the answer came back, I am Jesus whom you persecute. 
My, 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 that must have been a scary moment. Uh, 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 who are you? <laughs> I was so holy and so righteous in my legalistic works. I was faultless. Yet I was persecuting the Lord himself. That's what our attempts at making ourselves holy do. It persecutes the work of God. It sets a standard other than God's standard that we run to. We esteem ourselves higher than we ought to. We must learn that God wants us to reflect His holiness in our lives. He wants us to set our thoughts upon things above so that His holiness invades the very thought process of our minds. And when he begins to invade the thought process of our minds, our minds will be renewed and our actions will be renewed. And all those things that we try to keep under wraps so we can look like good church people, when our thoughts are stayed upon the Lord and stayed in his word, they begin to come into submission to the authority of God's word as we establish it in our hearts and our spirits. We begin to reflect the standard of God's holiness in our lives, not because we're afraid not to, but become, because it becomes the supernatural who we are. Some people wonder why would we want to learn to live and walk in holiness? Because holiness is the mark of being with God and knowing Him in a relationship of submission to Him. Holiness causes us to esteem others higher than ourselves even as Jesus did. Holiness enables us to live at peace with God, at peace with ourselves, and at peace with others. When we walk in holiness with God, we are free of bitterness and immorality. When we have seen God and accepted the accreditation of His holiness to our accounts, we respect and appreciate our birthright in Jesus Christ. Hebrews 12, 14 through 17 becomes our warning and our encouragement to walk in right relationship with God, ourselves and others, to manifest true holiness. Hebrews chapter 12, starting at verse 14 says, Make every effort to live in peace with everyone and to be holy. Without holiness, no one will see the Lord. See to it that no one falls short of the grace of God and that no bitter root grows up to cause trouble and defile many. See that no one is sexually immoral or is ungodly like Esau, who for a single meal sold his inheritance rights as the oldest son. Afterward, as you know, when he wanted to inherit this blessing, he was rejected. Even though he sought at the blessing with tears, he could not change what he had done. Preparation, separation, and consecration are the areas of holiness that we'll talk about next week. But before we look at those, we need to set in our minds that we need to understand and we need to recognize that holiness is not something that comes from within the man. It comes from within God. If there is something in your heart that longs to be holy, to be set apart, to be consecrated to the Lord. The only way you will ever know how to allow that holiness that you received at salvation to manifest in and through your life is to spend time with God, recognizing that it's His life that's going to flow through ours. And so for tonight, we need to ask ourselves, do I truly recognize the holiness of God? And if so, am I allowing the gift of holiness to work its work in me? Am I allowing God's holiness to conform me to His image and His likeness? Rest assured that I'm not asking you or myself to strive for absolute perfection, as in to be without fault. It's been suggested that a better word than be perfect as I am perfect would be to be mature as I am mature to grow and to develop into maturity 
as you walk with the Lord. As we grow into perfection or maturity with the Lord, we grow in the holiness of the Lord. Or we allow the holiness of the Lord to grow in us and to shape us and to mold us. I'm not asking us to be faultless. I'm asking us to allow the holiness of God to be manifest in our lives. I'm asking us to allow God to take our hearts and to mold them, to take our minds and to transform them, to take our wills and to conform them to His will. We were going to close singing that song tonight, but due to some technical issues, we will not close singing the song. <laughs> but I'm sure we're at least familiar with the song. And that one chorus or verse, I'm not very good with music. I don't know if it's a chorus or a verse, and it probably doesn't really matter. But it says, take our hearts and mow them. Take our minds and transform them. Take our will and conform them to yours. To yours, O oh Lord. And may those simple words be our prayer and our pursuit this week. That the Lord would mold, transform, and conform us to His will. So that we can know what it is to walk in holiness with Him. After all, the Bible does say that nobody will ever please God apart from holiness. We will never see God or know Him apart from holiness. Why do we need to be holy? Because He is holy and He has extended that privilege that we could share in His holiness. That we could be molded, transformed, and conformed to His image and His likeness. That we could bear the family resemblance. Did you ever see a picture of somebody and say, oh yeah, that's, that's the you know, Smith family or whoever it is. Holiness should be such a mark of our lives that when people walk down the street, they say, oh yeah, that's one of God's people. It looks just like them. And that's what happened in Antioch in the early church. They called the followers of Jesus Christians there for the first time. It was kind of an insulting thing. Like, oh, they're little Jesuses. They're little followers of Jesuses. Do you know why they call them that? Because they were actually doing the things that Jesus did. And said, so, yeah, they're little Jesus running around all over the place. Should there be enough evidence con to convict you and I of the name of Jesus?